Let's see. I like Looney Tunes, and I make videos. Maybe I should make a video reviewing and ranking all the Looney... Uh, uh, oh my, that's... That's a lot of cartoons. Yeah, this is gonna take a while. So, okay. Before we get started, some housekeeping stuff. Instead of doing them all at once, I'm just going to review them 100 at a time. And then after all the reviews are done, there's going to be one final video that it's just going to be the ranking from the worst Looney Tunes cartoons to the best. Hopefully that'll be out by the end of the year, but don't hold me to that. Because of the sheer number of cartoons that I have to wade through, most of these reviews are going to be really short. Not that there's much to say about some of them anyway. Oh, and just so we're clear, these are reviews of every Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoon from the 1930s to the 1960s and Norman Normal. Also, the Private Snafu cartoons are not going to be reviewed, mostly because as classified films produced for the United States Army, those were never intended to be seen by the general public, and so they're not really Looney Tunes cartoons. Maybe they'll get their own separate video, but for now, let's just stick with the official Looney Tunes cartoons. Also, you might be aware that most of the cartoons of this era were not known for their political sensitivity, shall we say. So it's worth noting here that I'm not going to highlight every single time that there's an offensive or insensitive joke somewhere in a cartoon unless it's integral to the cartoon, mostly because, well, it happened a lot in the 30s and 40s, and stopping the review to make a note of it every single time that happens is going to get tedious after a while. So, unless it's important to talk about, like with the Censored Eleven, I'm probably just going to not bring it up. Just be warned that some of these cartoons that I talk about, even ones I talk about positively, are going to have gags or jokes in it that would not fly today for obvious reasons. Also, also, you're going to have to forgive me here. Some of the cartoon footage that you're about to see is of remarkably poor and grainy quality. I'm sorry, but some of these cartoons have not had an official or remastered release, so I can only work with what I can find. Anyway, that's enough housekeeping. Let's just jump right in. Technically not a Looney Tunes short, and it wasn't even released to the general public until 2000, but it is essentially the Looney Tunes pilot, so we might as well take a quick look at it. Bosco the Talk Inc. Kid is kind of rudimentary and really only interesting as a historical artifact. A lot of the animation gags are pretty basic, and there's not really much of a plot, which makes sense because this was just intended to be a pitch. Although, I admit, I do like the effect of Bosco being sucked back up by the pen. The sound work is pretty bad, but I'll cut them a little bit of slack. Sound films had only been around for two years by that point. Overall, it's relatively harmless, and it's a quick watch if you're curious. Sinking in the bathtub. It's mostly just a bunch of cartoon gags spread over 8 minutes. It's not as much fun as you would think, mostly because the pacing feels a little off, moving a touch too slow. It's mostly just the kind of bouncy, nonsensical stuff that the 30s cartoons get stereotyped as, only without the violent slapstick. Also, that's all folks is first said here, showing it was said from the beginning, just in case you were curious. Congo Jazz Pretty much more of the same from the previous cartoons, only there's less gags, further spread out over a shorter runtime. The best joke is the coconut gag, which would absolutely not have flown once the Hayes office was established. Hold Anything, also known as the one where Bosco decapitates Mickey Mouse. That one gag alone makes this one worth watching. The Booze Hangs High, mostly known as the one with the drunk pigs. Just more of the same bland, bouncy, music-based gags. Nothing much to say here. Boxcar Blues. This one actually has some solid animation gags involving the train, but the aspects involving Bosco are still boring. There's just not much to his personality at all. And we're five cartoons in, and they've already recycled a gag from the first cartoon. Big Man from the North. So, we finally get a Bosco cartoon that actually has a real plot at least until it reverts for about two minutes back to its roots. However, it does get back on track for the ending, including an actually kind of fun and surprisingly brutal fight scene. Looks like we're finally starting to get some of that old-school statistic cartoon violence that we all know and love. Ain't Nature Grand. 
Well, that foray into storytelling didn't last long. Pretty much the only memorable thing here is that Bosco is an unrepentant poacher, and yet at the same time marvels about how beautiful nature is. Yeah. Ups and downs. So, there's a bit in here where a dog purchases a hot dog, the hot dog suddenly comes to life, they discover that they're related, and then they skip merrily away, both of them barking with delight. Okay, that's a thing that happened. Anyway, this one's weird because this legitimately feels like two separate cartoons. One where Bosco is a hot dog seller, and another where the, he's a horse racer, with very little segue in between the two. But eh, it has about as much consistency as anything that's come before it. Dumb Patrol. This one had real potential to be great. It's a good plot, with some actually above-average gags. The image of Bosco turning the dog into a plane while shooting fence pickets like it's bullets is truly enjoyable. And, for the first time, there's actually something resembling tension with the climax. Unfortunately, there's a musical interlude with Bosco and Honey that absolutely did not need to be here. Oh well, at least this one was different compared to the other ones. Yodeling Yokels it's yodeling. That's about it. Although there is one bit where Bosco shoots an owl for no discernible reason and then laughs. But other than that, there is nothing here that you couldn't see done better in other cartoons. Bizarrely, the cartoon keeps cutting back to scenes of a mouse doing miniature golf on Swiss cheese that's not connected to the rest of the plot in any way. Maybe it was supposed to be a cutaway gag, but they forgot to include the setup line. Who knows? Bosco's Holiday. Even though he doesn't really go on holiday, but rather just goes on a picnic with honey. That's not confusing at all. Honestly, the best part is the opening where a phone and alarm clock try to wake Bosco up. Aside from that, there's not much here. The Tree's Knees. There's a moment where it looks like a bird craps on Bosco's head, but turns out it was actually just spit. That was the only time I was even slightly engaged by this complete trite. Nothing happens here. The gags are so weak that staying engaged by what's on the screen is a real test of endurance. So very bad because it has absolutely nothing to offer. Lady, play your mandolin. The very first Mary Melodies cartoon and the first cartoon of the bunch to not have Bosco in it. Instead, we have yet another Mickey Mouse wannabe, Foxy. Add this onto the pile of the dull music-based cartoons without much personality. Smile, darn ya, smile. I actually like the song that they use throughout this cartoon, but this is where it's at its most obvious that these are rip-offs of Mickey Mouse cartoons. Bosco's Shipwrecked. This one could have been really good, and it has a real banger of an opening with Bosco and another crew member surviving a terrible storm out on the open water. Then it kind of slows down for a little bit before it picks back up with Bosco fighting both a lion and cannibals. The lion fight is easily the highlight of the short, and had the middle been better utilized, I probably would have found this to be the best of the bunch so far. One more time, the final Foxy cartoon. Honestly, what can I even say about this one? It's got a few mildly amusing gags, but that's it. Roxy gets kidnapped near the end, only to be saved five seconds later. What was the point of that? Bosco the Doughboy. Okay, this one's actually pretty good. Not great, but pretty solid. Most of the gags work, it's tight, it's focused, and some of the imagery is actually kind of subtly disturbing. This is the first Looney Tunes cartoon that I can say is actually good. You don't know what you're doing. These early Merry Melodies cartoons are almost indistinguishable from each other. Only now we have Piggy as the main character instead of Foxy. Piggy and Foxy, these are some really creative names that you've got here. It doesn't matter what you call them, they're both obviously trying to be the Mickey Mouse for Warner Brothers. Bosco's Soda Fountain. More recycled gags, more listless plotting, more Disney envy. This was amusing at first, but it's getting so tired now. We also get introduced to a new character, Wilbur, who is thoroughly detestable. Oh, deep joy. Hitting the trail for Hallelujah Land. Ah, yes, the first of the infamous Censored Eleven. 
For those who don't know, the Censored Eleven are a group of 11 Warner Brothers cartoons that were withheld from syndication by United Artists due to containing offensive ethnic stereotypes that were so endemic to the cartoon that they simply couldn't edit them out. And while I can understand why the other 10 were picked, I have a hard time seeing why this one in particular was singled out. Not that it matters much, because just like all the other ones before it, there's just nothing about it that really stands out about it, other than the fact that parts of this cartoon blatantly rip off Steamboat Willie. Anyway, this one has some decent skeleton animation during the graveyard scene, which at least means the middle part is interesting enough to watch, which helps it overcome its lackluster beginning and ending. Honestly, if it wasn't for the fact that this was one of the Censored Eleven, nobody would pay any kind of attention to it whatsoever. Bosco's Fox Hunt well, now we can add Bruno, a blatant copy of Pluto, to the cast of characters. The most interesting thing about this one is that there's hints of a darker, more sadistic sense of humor that are begging to come out. Red-Headed Baby The first Warner Brothers cartoon without any of their staple characters, but instead includes just a bunch of one-shots. This one's surprisingly decent. It's still pretty bland and inoffensive, but there are some decent gags, and the plot is actually fine and paced decently. Bosco at the Zoo Bosco and Honey go to the zoo, except Bosco winds up abandoning Honey to go have a pointless fight with an ostrich. I'd say that it was clever writing if it was done intentionally, but as far as I can tell, it wasn't. There's also a part where Bosco spanks a monkey. I have nothing more to add. Pagan Moon in today's episode of moments that wind up being far crueler than the filmmakers intended, there's a bit where the main character puts a stick in an alligator's mouth so that he can reach inside it and grab his guitar that the creature had just swallowed, and then just leaves it behind in that vulnerable state. Battling Bosco You'd think with over a dozen cartoons prior to this that the filmmakers would have given Bosco a personality, even accidentally, but it just hasn't happened yet. Also, why isn't this cartoon called Boxing Bosco? Freddy the Freshman I am getting really tired of watching old cartoon characters dance to old music. I get the feeling that these were not made to be binge-watched back-to-back. That being said, Freddy is probably the most interesting main character we've had so far, which, to be fair, isn't saying much. Big-Hearted Bosco The first two minutes is devoted to just Bosco and Bruno skating on ice. The baby doesn't even get found until three minutes in, which wouldn't bother me too much if it weren't for the fact that it just ends so abruptly, or if it actually had decent gags. The closest we get to an amusing moment is when Bruno's bottom gets set on fire. Crosby, Colombo, and Valley So, the premise of this one is that a group of Native Americans find a radio and become enthralled by the voices of the white singers on the radio. Then a fire begins ravaging out of control because it too was dancing to the same music and the natives didn't even notice it at first because they were just so enraptured by the music. And while they manage to save some birds, the forest around them is still burning down with no apparent way to put it out, effectively dooming them. There is some rather interesting subtext that you could definitely read into here about colonialism that I 100% do not believe was intentional, but... It is there nonetheless, and that unintentionality makes this easily the best one so far. Bosco's Party There's a few surprisingly above-average gags in this one, from the shockingly risque mirror joke to the shh gag, which is well-developed and manages a shockingly and refreshingly mean-spirited feel. There is no reason for this one to turn out as good as it ended up being. Goopy Gear Goopy's first cartoon, a character that bears a striking resemblance to a certain anthropomorphic Disney dog character. But it's actually not Harmon and Icing's fault this time. Goopy actually predates Goofy by about one month. Anyway, the chicken broth gag is the only amusing thing in this otherwise rote Merry Melodies. Bosco and Bruno The first five minutes are actually pretty well done, even if it does reuse a gag from Big Hearted Bosco, but in his defense, it actually does it better. And overall, it's got a pretty good, solid madcap energy, at least until it ends on a whimper by reusing animation from both Boxcar Blues and Smile Darnia Smile. It's got me again. The first Warner Brothers cartoon to be nominated for an Academy Award. 
it's just a bunch of Mickey Mouse clones dancing to some music, at least until the cat comes into the picture in the last two minutes. And then it gives way to some chaotic cartoon violence, including having the mice shoot a drumstick up the cat's anus. This one actually has a pretty good atmosphere compared to their previous shorts, like how this short utilizes the rain. Had the first five minutes been as fun as the two, this easily could have been great. Moonlight for two. I don't know if it's because they're improving or if it's because of the poor quality of the previous cartoons I watched, but the backgrounds in this one feel pretty particularly remarkably crisp. Plot-wise, though, it's more of the same harmless fluff. Bosco's Dog Race. Really only worth watching if you want to see a worse version of the great snail race from Spongebob. The Queen was in the parlor. Shockingly enjoyable. Here, they actually tried to experiment a little bit with different camera angles, particularly during the sword fight, and the whole thing has a pretty solid medieval atmosphere. This also contains both their first celebrity parody and their first pop culture reference, wherein they take a swipe at Amos and Andy, showcasing hints of their more cynical contemporary style that'll become more commonplace in their future cartoons. Bosco at the Beach There's one bit where Bruno steps on attack and Bosco takes it out, but Instead of, you know, throwing it away or something, he simply puts it right back where it was so that someone else can step on it. Here is another one where they don't even try to hide the fact that they're ripping off Disney. I love a parade. I don't know what's more bizarre, the fact that this cartoon is about a circus and not a parade, or the fact that Gandhi, of all people, makes an appearance only for them to not do anything with him. Bosco's Store. This is essentially a remake of Bosco's Soda Fountain, Literally, the plot is almost identical, including even using the same accordion dog gag. Bosco the Lumberjack. Starts off with some solid tree-cutting gags, but then it quickly devolves into a tired old climax of a nameless tough guy villain kidnapping the main lead's girl. You're too careless with your kisses. So, the message I took away from this is that wives shouldn't leave the house in a fit of rage after their husband comes home late after a night of drinking, or else they'll get kidnapped by a nefarious villain. Also, the villain's house is covered in spider webs, but apparently he's supposed to be a ladybug, not a spider. Also, also, the animation is sloppy in the most bizarre of ways, including one shot that's completely out of focus. Ride him, Bosco. A rip-roaring cartoon with some good, solid Old West gags. And shooting. Lots and lots of shooting. And here, the damsel in distress climax actually fits the story a lot better, rather than feeling arbitrarily tacked on. Also, the ending is hilarious. Legit the funniest moment in this series of cartoons so far, which even dabbles in a creative bit of postmodernism that seems pretty well ahead of its time. I Wish I Had Wings. The size of that giant worm in this guy gave me the heebie-jeebies, maybe because it looked like a snake. This one's overall pretty dry, all things considered. The plot really doesn't start until about three minutes in, and even then the next minute is still pretty dry and unengaging. It does pick up a little bit of the back end, especially with the scarecrow bit, but in my opinion, it's not enough. Bosco the Drawback. Some of the gags are recycled from Freddy the Freshman only they're not utilized in a fresh way. Aside from the typewriter gag, there's nothing unique about this one. A Great Big Bunch of You. There's kind of an underlying sadness and melancholy to this one, in which we see a mannequin that, despite being thrown away with the garbage, seeks to find the music amidst the heap of junk that now surrounds him. It's kind of oddly beautiful in a strange way. Bosco's Dizzy Date. The sheer lack of effort in this one is appalling. There is no imagination, and there is no creativity. This is just very safe, sanitized, unengaging fluff. Also, I should mention that two versions of this cartoon exist, for some strange reason. The other is called Bosco and Honey, and as far as I can tell, they're the same cartoon, just with a few gags changed slightly. The changes are so minimal that, honestly, it's almost not even worth bringing up. Three's a crowd. It's mostly just a bunch of literary references. Although, I did like the design of Mr. Hyde and the pencil sharpener gag. 
Bosco's Woodland Days. Four minutes. Let me repeat that. Four minutes of a seven-minute cartoon is devoted to watching Bosco and Bruno play hide-and-seek. That kind of pacing is inexcusable, especially since this is cartoon number 47. They should not be making mistakes like that at this point. The Shanty Where Santa Claus Lives. This one opens up actually kind of slow and dreary, showcasing how cold and empty Christmas felt during the Depression era. It's actually pretty well done, and it promises something different. Then in the second half, once Santa takes the poor orphan boy to his workshop, it kind of just devolves into the typical merry melody, singing and dancing. Such a shame. Bosco in Dutch. Characters sliding around on ice, and then Bosco and Honey sing and dance in wooden shoes, and then a last-minute conflict that gets resolved in seconds. So nothing out of the ordinary here. This one is only noteworthy as being Frizz Freeling's first directing credit. One step ahead of my shadow. Plot-wise, this ground has been tread before in other merry melodies. The difference between those and this one is that this cartoon has a lot of jokes surrounding Asian stereotypes, although nowhere near as offensive as you would think for the time period. And even putting that aside, there's just not much substance here. Bosco in person. It's just Bosco and Honey singing and dancing on a stage and making now outdated celebrity impersonations. There's just no substance and nothing to keep your interest. Young and Healthy. The animation on the stairs here feels incredibly wonky, distractingly so, which is surprising considering, for the most part, the animation so far has been pretty solid. Anyway, aside from that, I have almost nothing to say about this one. And now that's two cartoons in a row that have had a Jimmy Durant impersonation. Okay. Bosco the Speed King. Very much a run-of-the-mill Bosco short. It's clearly not even trying to go beyond okay enough. It's engaging enough and has just enough gags and it's paced well enough. The Organ Grinder. The animation seems a lot choppier this time around rather than how fluid and smooth it normally is. There's a quick gag about the monkey shaking his can that's kind of amusing, but otherwise it's mostly just a cartoon about a monkey dancing. Wake Up the Gypsy and Me. This isn't the first time they've done the villain kidnaps the girl to try to make her like him cliche for the climax, but this one is by far the creepiest. Bosco's Nightmare. I'm not sure why they even bother with taking almost two minutes to establish Bosco as reading a book about knights and then falling asleep and dreaming about being a knight when they could have just, you know, had him be a knight. Unless they really couldn't think of enough material for a seven minute cartoon. Which, given how there are so few gags in this, I can actually believe. I like mountain music. It's another one of those characters from books and or magazines and or products come to life at night shorts. Get used to them, there's more coming. For once, I actually understood who one of the celebrity impersonations was supposed to be without looking it up. For the record, it was the Will Rogers. Eh, I did like the raspberry gag, so there's that. Bosco the Sheep Herder. So, are they really intent on making these Bosco shorts as blandly as possible? Any traces of Bosco's crueler tendencies have been almost completely stripped away by this point, making the already plain character even more vanilla. Bo Bosco. Pretty much nothing happens in the first half, and the second half isn't that far behind it. The scene where Bosco and Honey climb up some swords and knives was a decent gag, but otherwise this is pretty standard. Shuffle off to Buffalo. I've never been a fan of the concept of baby factories in cartoons, mostly because the implications are horrifying if you think about it for longer than two seconds, and this one is no exception. Plot-wise, it's just a few mild gags mixed in with gags surrounding ethnic stereotyping, along with babies that are actually more horrifying than cute. Bosco's Mechanical Man, the first sci-fi Looney Tunes cartoon. Also, apparently, perfume makes robots flamboyantly gay, just in case you wanted to know. Honestly, the most disappointing thing about it is that I expected the robot to create way more havoc and chaos. The dish ran away with the spoon. It's living kitchen utensils doing mostly mundane things. 
and what qualifies as a living kitchen utensil is very inconsistent throughout the cartoon. Honestly, I wish this was an adaptation of Hey Diddle Diddle like I thought it was going to be. Although the cheese grater gag is actually pretty good. Bosco the Musketeer. It's more of the same. It features yet another climax where a big jerk tries to kidnap Honey and Bosco has to save her. Look, I'm not offended by the cliche, but can you please, please, please come up with something different? It's getting old. Bosco's Picture Show. And here it is, Bosco's final Warner Brothers cartoon. And believe it or not, he actually goes off on something of a high note. The gags on this one are mostly strong, including a really funny ending punchline that was different than what I was expecting. Also, the cartoon contains what many people believe is the very first cartoon depiction of Adolf Hitler, so that's interesting. Also, also, there's a moment where Bosco clearly says the F-bomb. Close captioning claims that he said Fox, but he clearly said the F-bomb. Maybe it was a recording flub, or maybe it was Harmon and Ising's way of giving a final insult to their boss, Leon Schleisinger. Who knows? We're in the money. The final Warner Brothers cartoon with any involvement from either Rudolph Ising and or Hugh Harmon. Ending something of an era for the studio. And the song does most of the heavy lifting this time around because it is a really good song, but the gags are totally and utterly forgettable. Buddy's Day Out. I take back every negative thing I said about Bosco because... My gosh, Buddy is so much blander and forgettable than Bosco ever was. There is no conflict, there are no clever jokes, and there's no point. This is cutesy crap meant only to appeal to little, little kids. This honest-to-goodness feels like the preschool version of the Warner Brothers cartoons that preceded it. And that's not a good thing. Okay, how many more of these Buddy cartoons do we have left? Oh my word. I've got to sing a torch song. I'm really hoping that Warner Brothers finds their footing soon because I don't know how much more of this bland blandness in which nothing happens I can take. Buddy's Beer Garden. Oh goody, another bland Buddy cartoon. Also, there's been a noticeable downgrade in the quality of the animation by this point now that Harmon and Ising are gone. The slapstick doesn't even feel the least bit solid anymore, so none of the gags land. Buddy's Showboat. You know what else I take back? I take back everything bad I said about Space Jam 2. At least that was a memorable train wreck. These buddy cartoons are like being bombarded with banality. Sitting on a backyard fence. There is improvement here. Some of the gags are actually decent, and this one at least tells something resembling a story. It's still not great, but I will happily take this over any of the four that preceded it. Buddy the Gob. The only reason this one stands out is that because this is Frizz Freeling's first solo directing credit. Unfortunately, he hasn't quite found his voice as a director yet. Anyway, this is probably the least bland of the buddy cartoons so far, although granted, it's probably because this one contains Asian stereotype jokes that make the ones in One Step Ahead of My Shadow look progressive in comparison. Petting in the Park. So, this one starts off with every animal in the park being horny for each other before it devolves into some kind of water race between the birds. Nothing much to say about this one. Honeymoon Hotel, the very first Warner Brothers cartoon in color. And, I'm not making this up, it's about two newlywed insects trying to consummate their relationship at a hotel while other insects try to watch them. And the climax, pun intended, is the hotel catching on fire because of it. It is astonishing to see in this absolute slew of mediocrity something this catchy, clever, and entertaining. Buddy and Towser. So let me get this straight. Buddy tells his dog Towser to guard the chickens, and yet he still ties him to his doghouse. Why? Also, who names their dog Towser? What in the world kind of name is that? Anyway... There's kind of an amusing gag about Buddy shooting a bear, and every time he does it multiplies, but other than that, there's nothing here. Buddy's Garage. Starts off with a few gags about the titular garage before it devolves into yet another kidnap and chase cartoon. 
And it's cartoons like this that really highlight just how much Buddy and Cookie are basically Bosco and Honey, just without, you know, what very little personality the latter two had. Beauty and the Beast. This one's alright. It's got kind of the feel of a fever dream that's not on crack, if that makes any sense. And I don't know why this one's called Beauty and the Beast when the short is clearly more of a reference to Babes in Toyland, but whatever. Those were wonderful days. Starts off bland, and even the climax starts off kind of bland as we get yet another villain kidnapped girl moment until we get to the cartoon's ending punchline, which I had to admit was actually pretty funny. Buddy's Trolley Troubles. There's a pretty funny moment when it comes to the convict dealing with his introduction, but other than that, this is mostly just a rehash of Smile Darn Ya Smile. Going to Heaven on a Mule. Okay, so this one is... Well, just look at it. To be frank, I'm shocked that this wasn't picked as one of the censored 11. Like, legitimately shocked. This cartoon is actually more racially insensitive than some of the ones that actually made the list. All the characters are in blackface, and this contains some pretty blatantly offensive gags, like when the main character uses a watermelon rind to play it like a harmonica. On the plus side, it showcased an African-American god a whopping 69 years before Bruce Almighty did it. Even still, the plot is so underdeveloped and poorly paced. This legit seems like a worse version of Sunday Go to Meet and Time, which we'll get into later. Buddy of the Apes. Buddy is basically Tarzan, and he has to outwit some native cannibals. It's just very blah. How do I know it's Sunday? Some decent gags, and the song is okay, but neither of them really stand out that much. Buddy's Bearcats. Mostly the same bouncy fluff that plagues Buddy's cartoons. At least Buddy's cartoons are getting better in the sense that I can watch these without wanting to gouge my eyes out, but that still doesn't mean that these are good. Why do I dream those dreams? This one is an adaptation of Rip Van Winkle, but only loosely as it focuses on the dream that he had while he was asleep, and what he dreams about is not really all that interesting. The Girl at the Ironing Board. The Night Fell joke was actually pretty funny. And the clothes coming to life and acting like humans does have some semblance of charm. Just not quite as much as I would have liked. The Miller's Daughter. This one's just kind of likable. Even if what should have been the main conflict of the cartoon gets resolved before it's even halfway over. It does have a pretty good ending punchline, though. Shake Your Powder Puff. A bunch of barnyard animals put on a vaudeville show. Aside from the shh gag near the start, there's just nothing much of interest here. Buddy the Detective. What? Who told the creators they were allowed to make a good Buddy cartoon? Anyway, all kidding aside, I love the macabre tone of this one, and the Mad Musician is such a fantastic villain. His plan involves kidnapping Cookie by hypnotizing her over the phone just so he can have her play the piano for him. That is just so pointlessly demented that I love it. Rhythm in the Bow. It's a cartoon about hobos on a train, until one random hobo gets off, and then it's just about him doing hobo things, I guess. Honestly, this one's so nondescript, I don't even know what to say about it. Buddy the Woodsman. I am pretty sure at this point the filmmakers realized that they could remake all their Bosco cartoons with Buddy as the lead, so what we get here is a soft remake of Bosco the Lumberjack. And believe it or not, it removes the utterly pointless hero chases after the villain after the kidnapping the hero's girlfriend cliche. And it replaces it with the more organic climax of a bear attack. Granted, this still isn't good, but at least it's not completely terrible. Buddy Circus. It feels like I've been saying too much positive about Buddy. Let's rectify that now. More overly cutesy schlock that you'll struggle to remember a thing about. Those Beautiful Dames. This one feels like a Depression-era cartoon, especially in terms of the story. More than just a series of gags, this is a cartoon that runs the full emotional gamut, from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs. This is the shanty where Santa Claus lives done correctly. It's not funny in the sense that it's laugh out loud, but it is exceptionally pleasant. 
I would have preferred it if the beginning was in black and white and the rest was in color, but that's probably expecting too much from a time period where color films were really new. Buddy's Adventures. This Buddy cartoon actually contains some cool imagery, most prominently the rattlesnake cloud. It's like these tiny bits of genius that peek into these otherwise benign cartoons desperately trying to get out. Pop Goes Your Heart. It's your typical animal-based gag cartoon, only it's in color. This is refreshing to me, but I can imagine how these bursts of color cartoons would have been to an audience back in 1933. The swan gag was a shockingly mean joke that highlights that typical Looney Tune cynicism that will define their later cartoons. Viva Buddy. After three Breath of Fresh Air cartoons, now we're back to the utterly derivative. Anytime it feels like we're almost getting somewhere better, they wind up backtracking. And the ending to this one is just lame. Buddy the Dentist. This one is actually kind of shockingly cruel for a Buddy cartoon. The entire thing revolves around Buddy trying to pull one of his dog's teeth out. Buddy of the Legion. Buddy daydreams that he's in the Foreign Legion. Uh, the only thing worth mentioning with this one is that this is Chuck Jones' first credited work as an animator in a Looney Tunes short. Mr. and Mrs. is the name. This one has the only appearance of Buddy and Cookie in a color cartoon, and I am not making this up, the appearance of completely topless mermaids sans nipples. Unfortunately, it does devolve into the typical bouncy nonsense that we've seen a million times before. Country Boy. A loose reinterpretation of Peter Rabbit that gets dangerously close to copyright infringement that teaches kids that it's wrong to eat your vegetables. I think that's the message I was meant to take away from this. Buddy's Theater. It's mostly just a bunch of dated references and overused gags. That's about it. And the ending is just a worse version of the Bosco Picture Show ending punchline. I haven't got a hat. The first appearances of Beans the Cat and, most prominently, Porky Pig. In an era where all the cartoon characters more or less have the same falsetto voice, hearing Porky stutter was a huge relief to my ears. This was very clearly an attempt to try to showcase and introduce some possible characters that could take the spotlight away from Buddy, but I don't see that as a bad thing. And given that one of them actually managed to become a breakout character, I'd say it very much succeeded at what it set out to do. I'll admit, I didn't like this cartoon when I first saw it, but now, viewing this in its proper historical context by watching everything that preceded it, it managed to make me appreciate it all the more. And, if nothing else, it does manage to capture the feel of the awkwardness of a children's school play. And that's it for the first 100 cartoons. We are a full 10% done. I know this wasn't the strongest collection of cartoons, but still, it was interesting to look back at the origins of Looney Tunes, their failures, them desperately trying to find their voice, and trying way too hard to be the next Disney. But even so, I did manage to find some genuinely good cartoons tucked away and hidden in between mostly filler. I suspect that in the next 100 cartoons, we're going to start seeing some improvements. We're finally going to see the end of Buddy. We're going to see more of Porky Pig, as well as the start of Daffy Duck. And behind the scenes, we're finally going to see some more recognizable names, like Frank Tashlin and Tex Avery in the director's chairs, as well as finally getting to hear Mel Blanc voice some characters. I also feel like there's going to be the start of a tonal shift that really begins to get off the ground. Getting away from the typical old-school Disney-type cartoons meant for kids that they had done up to this point, up to the more cynical and modern cartoons aimed more at adults that Warner Brothers cartoons are mostly known for. It's going to be an experimental time, and I'm actually looking forward to revisiting some of these, as well as maybe hopefully discovering a hidden gem or two. And I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to be notified of when Part 2 comes out, make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Anyway, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.